Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the book of 1 Corinthians. I'll be reading chapter 11, verses 23 through 26, and this is what it says. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Pray with me. Jesus, may we never take this day lightly because you're here never for granted. Thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. What is it that helps you remember? Is it words? Do you write yourself lists? I'm a list maker. I leave lists <laughs> just about everywhere I go. My wife kind of teases me about it. I, it's the words. It's the words, and it's something about them, those words going from my, my, my mind to my hand to on the, onto the paper, and it's the word, is it, is it lists, is it words that help you remember? I remember when my son was in third grade, he said, Dad, can I have a dirt bike? And I thought, what in the world? I said, Taylor, what made you want a dirt bike? He said, well, a friend of mine at school talks about his dirt bike, and it just sounds like a lot of fun. Well, I remembered I had a dirt bike when I was seventh grade. I had to work for a year to buy my dirt bike, and, and it was a tremendous amount of fun. I was bitten by the bug, and I, I loved riding dirt bikes when I was a kid. And, uh, but third grade, I said, well, I'll tell you what, Taylor, when you get to be sixth grade, ask me again, and we can talk about it then. Well, the boy has memory of an elephant. I mean, he, he remembers it all. So, it was the summer before his sixth grade year. He said, Dad, you said when I got to be sixth grade, we could talk about a dirt bike. Well, I had said that, and we, we talked about it, and, and I got to thinking, you know, I can't just buy my son a dirt bike and say, jump on the motocross track, I'll see you when you're done, or ride out in the woods, and I'll be, I, I had to get a dirt bike too. So the two of us had dirt bikes. And for over 10 years, every opportunity we had, we'd be out in the woods, we'd be on the motocross track, we'd be out riding the dirt bikes. And you know what I did? For over 10 years, I wrote down the words. Just a few words to remember every single ride, starting November 16th, 2003. For over, two, over 10 years, I just wrote a few words and I can look through these words for hours and remember what happened back in 2005. What happened back in 2006 on a particular day and the two of us spending time together. Sometimes it's words. 
What helps you remember? Is it the words? Sometimes it's the words. You know, but other times, it's symbols. Symbols. Our, our world has, has, depending on symbols, maybe more than we have in, in centuries. I, every time you pick up your phone, you look at an app and it doesn't say, this app is for text messages. It's not words. No, it's a little bubble, conversation bubble. And it's a symbol. It's a, it's a picture that reminds you of the, how to make text messages, the app for text messages. And emails, it, it, there's not a little app that says this app is for emails. No, it's, the, it's a symbol. It's a, it's a picture. Symbols are, are, are powerful ways. They, they so, say so much more than, than words can ever say. It was about 112 years ago. I was pastor of my first church, and I loved that little church. It was down in LaGrange, Georgia. Every Sunday morning, we'd have about 26 people. If we had 25, we knew who was missing. And every Sunday night, about 10 or 12 of them would come back. And one of those women that was there every Sunday morning and every Sunday night was a woman named Fannie Mae Vollenweider. Now, when you have a name like Fannie Mae Vollenweider, you don't forget that name. That sounds like it belongs in a book, doesn't it? She was the sweetest, most gracious person. But once you got to know her, she had a sly sense of humor. Well, one morning she came to church and she said, Preacher, I made something for you yesterday and I wanted to give it to you because it reminded me of you. And this is what she gave me. Now, a lesser man would have had his feelings hurt right then. This creepy little thing somehow <laughs> reminded her of me. And then she had that sly grin on her face that Miss Vollenweider often had. She said, all you got to do is rub his head and make a wish. <laughs> I keep this on my desk at home. And it not only reminds me of Miss Vollenweider, who would invite me to to dinner after dinner after dinner with her and her family. She made me a part of her family. It reminds me of, of all those people, gracious, gracious people that God has put in my path over the years. And I think of those stories. All I gotta do is look at this creepy little thing and I remember those stories. Sometimes, sometimes it's the symbols. Sometimes it's the words. What helps you remember? Is it the symbols or is it the words? Well, for Paul, it was both. It was both the symbol and the words. And the problem was, is that the people, this church in Corinth, they were not treating the symbols the way they should be treated. And the symbol that he's pointing to is, is he's pointing to the bread and to the cup. That it was a, a symbol, the bread and the cup, a symbol of their, their coming together, that each one would put their little with God's much, and together they would have a holy meal because they shared with one another in the body of Christ. And that was Jesus that was still living through them, even though he had been crucified, dead and buried, even though he rose from the dead, that he was still living in and through them as they came together. And they could put their little with God's much, and, and there would be more than enough. Everybody would bring what, what, what they had and there would be more than enough wine for them. They would bring what they had and, and there would be more than enough bread for them. And they would have a holy meal together. And they would share it knowing that they were the, the, the living body of Christ in the world. What a powerful symbol of, of coming together, remembering who who they are and whose they are as the body of Christ. But that's not what they were doing. Paul tells them in words, I would love to give praise to you. I'd love to brag on you about how, but you all are using the very thing, the very symbol that, that, that should bring us together and remind us of, of who you are and whose you are. You're using that symbol to divide and separate from one another. That what some of you are doing, he says, is, is, is that you're eating beforehand and you're bringing your leftovers. Just a little bit of bread. 
Because you're saying my bread is my bread. My wine is my wine. I'm not going to share that with everybody. I, I've got more than they do. That they weren't putting their little with God's much. They were holding on. They were hanging on. And, and the very symbol used to, to, to remember who they were was now a symbol used to divide them one from another. And he points to this symbol, says you're mistreating it. But he not only does it with symbol, he does it in words. He reminds them, he helps them remember in the words. And that's, those are the words that we, we read this morning. He gives a a three-part invitation, a three-fold invitation. And I think he does it in threes, so we'll remember. And do you remember what we read? He said, on the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. That's the first, first of the invitation. The second is that, and when he had given thanks. And the third is, and he broke it. On the night when he was betrayed, he took bread. That's the first thing that I want to talk about this morning. To help you and me remember. Those are the words. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. Well, we've heard those words again and again. Every time we take communion, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread. But why? Why did Paul say on the night he was betrayed? Why not on the night that he washed the disciples' feet? Or on the night of the Passover? Or on the night in the upper room. Or on the night that he told them how he would be crucified, dead and buried and rise on the third day. Of all the things he could have said, he said on the night he was betrayed. Why bring his betray? Why, why hang it on that memory on the night he was betrayed he took bread? I think he did it. So you and I would remember who's at the table. Judas is at the table. Judas is offered the cup and the bread of forgiveness. Peter, his best friend who denied knowing him, was offered the cup of forgiveness before he had denied him. Judas had already sold him for 30 pieces of silver. He would only complete that the most heinous of all deeds in all of history, he would only complete it and seal it with a kiss. Just a few hours later, Jesus knew it. Jesus told him. And still, Jesus offered forgiveness to Judas. The most heinous sinner in all of history is offered the bread and the cup. It was on the night he was betrayed. This is no small grace. That's what Paul wants you and me to remember. This is no small grace. This isn't just a bunch of of fresh-faced followers that are good and getting better day by day. And, and, you know, if you ever thought of anything that wasn't nice or happy, uh, he forgives you that. No. This is Judas, the betrayer, that's at the table. And the words remind us That if forgiveness is offered to Judas, there is hope for you and me. There's hope in the forgiveness that Jesus offers. It's not a small grace. It's not a small forgiveness. It was on the night he was betrayed. He took the bread. This morning... It may be that you have a burden. It may be that you betrayed your values. It may be that you betrayed the way you were raised. Or it may be that you betrayed a loyalty. This is for you. Jesus died on the cross and offered his body and his blood for you, for your forgiveness. It's no small grace that he took all those things that would destroy us, the guilt and the shame, the sin, 
and he nailed it to the cross for your forgiveness and mine. It's no small grace. He rose from the grave to live his life through you and through me. And that's, that's why we, we take this cup, why we take this bread, and we eat it, that we'll remember that it's his body, it's his blood that lives in you and me to gives us power enough to receive that forgiveness. It may be that you came this morning with a burden. Leave it here today. Let go of it and let Jesus have it. Paul wrote some words. He points to a symbol. It's the words and the symbol so you and I would remember that it was on the night he was betrayed that he took the bread. But Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, And when he had given thanks, in verse 24, when he had given thanks. Now think about that. Think about that. This is the night that he's betrayed that Jesus has given thanks. It's not like they just finished a party and they cut into the cake and they all had ice cream and everything was just wonderful. No, he's pointing to his body and blood that he knows that night he's going to be carried off by the temple guards and the Roman soldiers. He knows he's going through a mock trial and the next day he'll be crucified on the cross. This isn't the kind of thing that life is good and it's just getting better because every moment is sweeter than the one before. Gratitude does not come from our circumstances and from our joy. Joy comes from our gratitude. And on the night he was betrayed, Jesus practiced gratitude that it's the eyes of gratitude that look to God and we put our little with God's much in gratitude we give our little to God and it comes back as joy we give what we have to God and it comes back as as gratitude and joy because we give that we are poured out the great joy of His Spirit. Not one day, this day. And because you give as the body of Christ, as we come together and and put our little with God's much, Because we give in gratitude, not under compulsion, not under guilt, because you give, the body of Christ right here in Roswell, that 40 support groups meet here on our campus every week. 40 groups reaching out into a community that needs to know just how much it is that Jesus cares for them. Now, when you hang on to your gratitude, when you hang on to your little, folks won't know that. But we put our little with God's much. And because you give, 40 support groups meet here every week. And because you put, because you give, 200 families are fed every month. Groceries. Every month, first Monday of the month, families line up. And through our our must neighbor pantry, we feed over 200 families, groceries, cleaning products, all the things that they would need during these hard financial times because we put our little with God's much because you give out of gratitude. Because you give out of gratitude. In the last couple of months, We've baptized two adults. Because you give, in the last couple of weeks, we've started three new Sunday school classes. Because you give, and put our little out of gratitude, we put our little with God's much. Our commons project, our commons project is, is, is a plan to, to open up the doors of this church into a world that needs to know who Jesus is. A door 
into this church for the community to come in and a door into the future that says God's not finished. That yes, yes, this, this pandemic was hard. Yes, economic times are hard, but we, we put our little with God's much and in gratitude we reach out to a world and we remember who we are. We are the body of Christ. Not one day, but this day. We're His body, His blood, His hope in a world that needs to know who Jesus is. So Jesus, Jesus gives us this, this, this bread and this cup and, and, and Paul points to it and he gives us the words to go along with it. On the night he, when he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, and the last thing it says, that he broke it. That Jesus broke the bread. That's not a throwaway line right there. So you and I would know that he gave his life. No one hunted Jesus down and found him in a cave, pulled him out and said, okay, now we're going to crucify him. That Jesus told his disciples that this is exactly what would happen. He told Judas, do what you must do quickly, and he sealed that betrayal with a kiss. He asked the temple guards and the Roman soldiers who were gathered there before him, and he said, whom do you seek? He asked that question again and again and again. Whom do you seek? And when they said, Jesus of Nazareth, he said, I am he. And with those words, the power of I am, he, it, they fell to the ground. The power of a word could knock down the, the, the armed guards and, the, and the, the Roman soldiers. And he gave his life to them and they led him off as a sheep being led to the slaughter. His life was not taken from him. He broke the bread he gave his life for you and me out of love. Out of an intense love for you and for me. Not because we've been so good. Because you remember it was on the night he was betrayed. That after he gave thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave his life for you and for me. So what do you do? What at church, what do we do? We use the words here. And we use the symbol here. And we take his life into our lives that we might be transformed by it. We eat. We drink. His body his blood, that he might live his life in us and we remember who we are and whose we are. The body of Christ in the world today. The body of Christ in the world today. In the first century, whenever they had worship, they would burn incense. The sweet-smelling incense there in worship will remind them that it was the Spirit of God that was in and around them. And every time they breathed in, that it was the Spirit of God that was coming in. And, and it was there in worship with them. And when they left service, it was that sweet smell of incense that was in their clothes. And they would remember that they were clothed with the sweet Spirit of Jesus as they walked out into the world. Well, we don't use incense in worship anymore. But we do remember that we're clothed in Christ. And the power, the power of the living Christ is in you. That you might remember who you are. You're the body of Christ. And that there's a world out there that needs to know who he is. It was on the night that he was betrayed, he took the bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it. 
Pray with me. Jesus, it may be there, folks, in the sound of my voice that came with a burden today. You have power we don't. The sweet smell of your spirit gives us strength to let go of that burden and receive your forgiveness. It also may be that we've not practiced gratitude. Instead of putting our little with your much and practicing gratitude, that we've said what's mine is mine. And we've held on through the power of your spirit, the sweet smell of you, Jesus. May we practice gratitude and give. Give words of praise, a symbol of praise and thanks. And allow you to live your life through us. Lord, you gave your life for us. It's an incredible love that we don't deserve. But you gave it anyway. May we never take it for granted. But know who we are and whose we are. We belong to you. And as your sons and daughters, as your men and women, as as your children, may we go into a world that needs to know who you are. May we be not only a symbol, but be your word into a world that needs to know who you are. Jesus, it's in your name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, Just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, Thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi, thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image. He made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir an organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.